right, good morning. If you would, turn in your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. I want to thank Pastor Jarrett for letting me be here, and thank you guys for letting me uh, open God's Word with you this morning. Uh, let's just get a little audience participation going right off the top. If you have a Bible with you, let me go ahead and see it right now. Up top, too. You guys, too. There we go. If you have something to take notes on, let me see that as well. And if you got an iPhone, you got all of it, right? Just know my space while we're in here together. That's okay. Um, we are going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 31. So just a little bit about me. Uh, met my wife, Macy, uh, when we were both doing ministry together. We were at the same D Now Freedom Weekend kind of thing. And it was love at first sight for me. And it was love at about a year later for her. Uh, but it worked out, and here we are. We have a two-year-old, almost a two-and-a-half-year-old, um, and we are having a baby boy in October. So we're very excited about that. Um, that also tells you uh, how to be praying for us. Our two-year-old told us this weekend that she wants to start potty training, so... Here we go. Uh, but life is great and get to serve here as the young adult pastor. Probably the most common question that I get is what is a young adult? Uh, a young adult here is anyone that's ages 18 to 40, but I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm like, if you feel like in here, like you're a young adult, why don't you just come and join us? It's a great time, uh, and we're having a great time getting to know the Lord together. Uh, but as I started off in ministry, I started in student ministry. I got to be a high school pastor and a student pastor for a number of years, and as I was preparing for our time together today in the Promise Keeper series, I thought about how many promises I heard as a student pastor like teenagers that would just come up to you and promise you anything that you could imagine. If you don't have a teenager, you've been a teenager before, you know, you hear some wild things. Now, there were some great things, some great promises that were made to me. Things like, Emory, I promise I I'm going to go through a discipleship program. And man, I was so excited to hear that. So like at Champion Forest here, we do what we call next steps. It's six sessions that are basically like the core fundamentals of Christianity and what we believe. And so they said, we're going to go through that. And we were so excited to hear that promise. But then after that, they would kind of one-up the promise, and you know that can get a little crazy sometimes, but usually it was, now I'm going to disciple someone else, kind of keep it going and disciple, mentor a peer of theirs. And that was really encouraging to see, and then some would even take it a step further and say, man, I'm going to give my whole life, I promise, I'm committing my whole life to ministry. And that was a number of years ago, so now as they are becoming adults, I'm seeing them get into ministry and serve the local church, and that is so encouraging and exciting to see. Like, those are great promises, but it's student ministry, right? They're teenagers. So they're not always promises like that. Sometimes you get wild promises. Like, there was always this one kid that would come up to me right before we would start the Wednesday night deal, and he would come up to me and he's like, I promise I'm going to distract you when you talk today. I'm like... Why is that a thing? Like, why does that come to your mind at all? And sure enough, we'd be getting to like this part and he's just doing cartwheels in the back, right? There were other promises like, hey, Emery, I promise I'm gonna skip camp and play Xbox at home all week. Again, I don't know what's going through your mind when you promise those kind of things. Uh, and then there were broken promises. Now, I'll tell you this uh, transparently. There were, there were broken promises that were pretty heavy. Uh, there were broken promises where uh, students would say, man, I'm going to keep my faith when I go off to college or to the workforce, and they strayed from their faith, and they would break that promise, but so many of them have come back to the faith, but those promises that were broken were tough, but nine times out of ten, the broken promises were more along the lines of, I'm going to meet you at 6.30 a.m. for a Bible study at Chick-fil-A. And I'm not gonna tell you, I'll let you determine uh, how often they came, but I'll just tell you, I ate a lot of Chick-fil-A by myself um, at 6.30 in the morning, a lot of coffee sitting alone uh, in a Chick-fil-A. But the promise that not di just didn't get broken, I mean, it got decimated, obliterated, disintegrated, like you picked the word, was when we go to camp every year, y'all know, and there'd be a group of boys, usually in middle school, and I'm not gonna look at any part of the room right now, but there would be a group of middle school boys that would say, we promise we're gonna go to bed on time. And it would be the first night of camp, and it'd be 3 a.m., and the room was basically on fire. It was not fun, it was not funny. I mean, that promise was broken. Well, here's the deal this morning. This is not just for 
Students, this is not just for any one group of people. This is for everyone. We've all promised people something and we've all experienced what it's like to be on the other end of a broken promise. And that's tough. I mean, everyone breaks a promise at some point in their life. You've had a best friend at some point that's broken a promise. And that's hard. Maybe your spouse has broken a promise at some point. So difficult. Maybe your kids, your parents have broken a promise that they've made to you at some point. And you know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that. But why do we break our promises? I mean, oftentimes we feel pressured. Like there's just something that comes along that might seem like a better opportunity, right? And we've given our word towards something to someone, but we go, mm, that sounds better. Sometimes we just simply forget I will be the first to volunteer for that. Guys in the room, I think we can all say that we've done that. Uh, my wife's asked me to bring home food after work. I say, absolutely, show up at home with no food. And she goes, are you forgetting something? And I broke a promise real quick, right? But more often than not, we simply overpromise. We overcommit. We make a promise that's past what we can fulfill. I've seen this in my own life. My finite ability, my humanity, my weakness is often revealed when I make a promise, but here's the beautiful thing about our God, is that he has never broken his word to us. Everything that he's promised us, he's delivered. Everything that he's assured us, he's brought to pass. If you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to write this down. Promises are only as good as the promise maker. Promises are only as good as the promise maker. You might've heard someone already this summer say that in their promise that they went through. And it's so true, think about that. The reason that you and I aren't very good at keeping our promises is we're not great promise makers, but the God that we serve has always kept his word. And the promise that we're gonna look at this morning is Deuteronomy 31, verse eight. Deuteronomy 31, verse eight, and it says this, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So here's the promise. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. So God promises us his presence. God promises his presence. And I can tell you right now that that's something that we need. Now, when you think about somebody's presence always being around you, you might think that that's not a great thing. Like you might think about Thanksgiving or Christmas where you have to spend time around people that just between us, maybe you don't wanna spend a lot of time with. And you think about someone's presence always being there could get old really fast, right? But God's presence, the promise of his presence is the most incredible beautiful blessing of a promise that we could experience. The promise of his presence brings so much significance. Like think about this if you've ever been alone. It's not fun. That's a hard place to be, especially if you don't know if that season is ever gonna end. That's a hard place to be, but when you realize that God promises us his presence, that we are never alone, that he will never leave us or forsake us, there is hope in this promise. If you look through scripture, you see the significance of God's promise from front to back of scripture. Look in the book of Exodus 33, it says, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. We need rest. It's kind of the second half of the summer and I know some of y'all in here and y'all are just begging for a nap. Like, I don't even need a whole lot. Give me like 45 minutes without an interruption where I can just go sleep, right? God's presence brings rest. God's presence also brings joy. In the book of Psalms chapter 16, it says, you make known to me the path of life. Get this, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy. His presence brings things that the world doesn't have. I mean, we live in a world where everyone's searching for joy. Everyone's looking for fulfillment, for a promise to hold on to. Uh, I, I know a lot of the time when we don't have joy, it's because of our circumstances, right? We take our eye off of God and look at what we have or don't have. Like if somebody asks you, how are you doing financially? And you get really quiet, and in the back of your mind, you just hear Darrell saying, I know the Lord will provide. Like you just don't know where you're at, right? But joy comes from the presence of God. God's 
presence also brings renewal. So take it a step further than just rest. Look in the New Testament at Acts chapter three, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. After the last couple of weeks that we've had, I, I need that. I don't just need a power nap. I mean, I, I need refreshing, renewal that comes from the presence of the Lord. And we see God's presence bring peace. In John 16, verse 33, it says that I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. That's something that we all look for, something that we strive for, something that we long for, but it feels like it's fleeting all the time. And we're gonna talk more about the peace that God's presence brings in just a little bit. But note this, like if you're a Bible scholar and you look at Deuteronomy 31, verse eight, just that verse in and of itself or in its context, which we're about to go over together, I want you to see that God promises us his presence, but... It doesn't mean that everything's always easy. It doesn't mean that everything's just gonna be a cakewalk your whole life. And I think so oftentimes we have a set of expectations that if God's with us, everything in our life is gonna fit in this comfortable box that we've created in our mind. And when anything else is different than that, we're upset. And so this morning, we're gonna go through three notes that we need to take about the promise of God's presence. And the first thing to write down that we're gonna to note together is that the presence of God looks different than we imagined. It looks different than we imagined. So let's get a little more context on what's going on in Deuteronomy 31 verse eight. What's going on here is Moses is addressing Joshua now one-on-one -on -one after he's addressed the nation of Israel in verses one through six. Chapter 31 of Deuteronomy is kind of Moses' farewell address, his final statement and speech to God's people, and he's recounting so much of what God's done and what he's learned and what he's been through, and he's encouraging God's people and now Joshua that God is still the same and his promises remain. So let's look at verses one through six, and we'll see how God's pr uh, presence looks different than we Imagine, look at verse one. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan to the promised land. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them and Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og and the kings of the Amorites and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you, verse six. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. So what's going on here? Moses is 120 years old. If you look at those opening verses of chapter 31, you see that it says he's 120 years old and then it says, I'm no longer able to go out and come in. Now you might think that when you read that at first glance, it's like, oh, he's not physically capable. Physically, he's actually in good shape. What this means is that he's no longer capable or ready to lead. So like in the book of 1 Kings in chapter three, when Solomon is ascending to the throne, he says, I don't know how to go out and to come in. He's saying, I don't know how to lead. And so what we're seeing here is there's a transition of leadership and Moses is saying, I'm not going to be the one to lead God's people into God's promised land. At this point, he knew that he wouldn't walk with his people into that promised land and he's telling Joshua, you're gonna be the one. And so what we see happening here is that there's this transition, this changing of plans of man, but God's promise is staying the same. That the people thought Moses would be the one. Moses thought he would be the one that led the people into the promised land, but that's changing. God's presence remains. Now, I don't know about you, but I know the exact place and the exact time in my life where I peaked athletically. Like there's never been a better moment than this in my entire life and it was in 10th grade when I was on the junior varsity track team 
for Westbrook High School and Beaumont Independent School District. And you might be thinking, Emory, you don't look that fast. You are absolutely right. There's another part of the team that's called the field team. And we just got together and we threw heavy objects. And that's what we did. And the peak of my athletic career was on the junior varsity field team, throwing the shot putt, and I won the district meet first place. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. I wanna put a little caveat in there that only two other people showed up that day because other schools were having bus problems. Don't read into that too much. It's just a gold medal, okay? Um, But the best part about being on the junior varsity track and field uh, on the field side was what they call the big man relay. Does anybody know what that is? The big man relay is where they take all the guys like me that are not good at running, at all, and they take them and they make a four by four relay team. And you take the biggest guys from the school on the team and you make them run as fast as they can and hand off a baton. And let me just tell you, it's like 10% for sport, 90% for entertainment for everybody that's there for the day. And it's hysterical. Not only are they moving more side to side than they are forward and while they're running, um, the, the transition, the passing of the baton is atrocious. I told my coach when we got back in the bus to go home that day, I said, if you would have used like a Big Mac as the baton, I think this would have gone a lot better, right? But the transition was atrocious. So what you see happening here is that there's a transition, a passing of the baton from Moses to Joshua, which so often goes poorly. I mean, you've seen it in your life, Uh, through elections, through different things that you could come up with where there's a transition happening and it doesn't go so well. But what we see happening here is that it looks different than what the people thought, than what Moses thought, than what Joshua thought, but because God's presence and God's power is there, the transition is not the focus because God's power and his presence remain. So get this, like Moses is 120 years old. He spent his first 40 years in Egypt, learning and growing in wisdom. Then he spent the next 40 years as a sojourner in Midian. And then in the last 40 years of his life, he spent guiding and leading and governing the Israelites. Now keep in mind, they are standing outside the promised land, waiting to go in. They've been waiting for years and years and years. A whole generation has passed waiting to go into the promised land. I don't know about you, but when I'm surrounded by enemies, I don't don't have that, but like I could imagine them being surrounded by enemies when I'm in a crazy spot in life and I don't know what's next. I don't want the guy who's at his first day on the job. I want the seasoned veteran leader, right? And so all of God's people are hearing, wait, this is gonna be the guy? This is not what we thought we were gonna get. We thought we were gonna get the guy that's been here for three generations, has seen us from slavery to freedom to the promised land, but it's someone new. The circumstances look different, but God is still the same God and his promises are the same. So I want you to ask yourself this morning, think about it. Does your life reflect that you believe what God says is true? Like, are you still obedient when your life doesn't look like what you expected it to. When when you're standing outside of something that you know God promised, but you feel like everything's against you, are you gonna trust the Lord or are you gonna throw in the towel and say, I don't know if we can do this? Trust that God's presence is his promise. The second note that we wanna take about the promise of God's presence this morning is that it does not have an expiration date. God's promise of his presence doesn't run out. So if you feel like, man, things are different in my life now because circumstances are changed. I don't know if God's gonna be with me. I feel like I might be alone. I don't feel like if he's going to be with me, I feel like he might leave me or forsake me. We can just go ahead and throw that away right now. His promises never run out. Look at verse seven. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him inside of all Israel, he says, be strong and courageous for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them and you shall put them in possession of it. Something that the people have been waiting on for years, some of them their entire life. And they think, man, maybe it's been too long. Maybe God's forgotten about us. Maybe something's changed. And Moses is telling Joshua, you're gonna be the one to lead them into the land that God promised their fathers. That God didn't forget 
that God didn't abandon his people, he's with them. So if you look at the original language that this was written in, Moses is kind of setting up a word picture here when he says, I'll never leave or forsake you. What's happening is you see kind of this picture of God's hand coming around God's people, coming around Joshua. It's not an absent-minded presence. It's something that's intentional, it's strong. He's not just gonna accidentally let them slip out of his hand. And with that also comes protection. No one can snatch them out of the hand of God. No one can take them or hurt them. And so he's telling them, when God's never gonna leave you or forsake you, it means that he is very present, very real, and he is strong, powerful, and he is a God that protects his people. This first generation, once they left Egypt and went into wandering in the desert for 40 years, they stayed there and didn't get to enter into the promised land because of their disobedience, because of their lack of faith. Moses doesn't enter the promised land because of sin in his life. So what we see happening here on top of everything else is that God keeps his word, but he still deals with sin. And this is a really serious thing. I mean, he takes it so serious that he says, hey, this whole plan that you had is gonna change, but I'm not going to leave you at the same time. That's a big God. When it changes from one generation to the next, you know, God will get a hold of you when you're prepping a lesson like this, prepping a sermon. And I started thinking about this. I started thinking about how often in my own life God has proved me yet and yet again that he is with me. That he's always with me when I need him. He's with me when I don't acknowledge that I need him, but he's always shown up, he's always provided, he's always been enough. But then I look at my child and the one on the way and I wonder. And I watch the news and I look at things around me and I go, we're gonna raise kids in this world? Where's the hope for that? That's a scary thought. Some of you in this room have children, have grandchildren, that you are scared to death about what's gonna happen to them and they're living in the same world that God has provided for you and protected for you and shown up for you time and time again. He's the same God for them that he is for you. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and his promises never run out. God takes care of his enemies. God takes care of his own. And the third thing that we wanna note this morning about the promise of God's presence is that it requires a response. It requires a response. I think we live in a day and age where a lot of people can say, I know God's word, and they kind of just leave it there. And what I love about our God is that he's teaching us not only who he is, and he's showing us the promises that he's giving us that he will always keep, but he also teaches us how we should respond, how we live in light of those promises and the character of God. Look at verse seven and eight. We're gonna see this promise and then we're gonna see our commanded response. In verse seven, it says, Moses summoned Joshua. This is just one-on-one in front of all of Israel. He says, be strong and courageous for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them and you shall put them in possession of it. Look at verse eight. It's the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So we see it in the positive in verse seven, uh, in the active in verse seven, and in the passive in verse eight. Be strong and courageous. And then verse eight, we see do not fear or be dismayed. So in verse seven, that's the verse that we like to post, that we like to encourage one another with, that we like to kind of think about. Be strong and courageous. Like, yeah, that gets me fired up. But more often than not, I need verse eight. I'm like already scared already worried, already dismayed. I'm already freaking out about stuff. I need to hear both of these things. I need God to meet me in my fear and dismay, tell me not to do that and teach me because his presence is always with me. I can, through him, be strong and have courage. I need him, but he teaches me how to walk with him and how to be obedient. Moses didn't trust God in the desert, that's why he's handing this baton off. But again, while the leadership changes, the circumstances change, the generations change, 
God's presence stays the same and demands a response yet again. And what I love about our God is that he will never command us to do what he does not equip us for. He will not command us to do something that he will not equip us for. That's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's a great encouragement that I need all day, every day, because some days, I don't know about you, but I have trouble getting out of bed in the morning because I know what's on my schedule. We gotta do what today? Uh, I might just hang out here for a little bit. He's gonna equip us for what he's called us to do. Now, I thought when like college was over and seminary was over, I'll just be like very transparent. My reading time went down significantly and I thought I was out of the woods with summer reading, but Pastor Jarrett got with us in May and said, surprise, we have a summer reading assignment for the staff. And I was not so excited at first, but then he told us the name of the book and it's called The Strength That You Need by Robert Morgan. And as soon as I heard the title, I was like, I will be reading that. I mean, I need all the help that I can get. I need all the strength that I can get. On my own, I'm out of gas by noon most days. And wouldn't you know, the opening chapter of this book is based off a text, a couple of chapters off of what we're reading today. We're reading Deuteronomy 31, verse eight. But the opening chapter of the strength that you need is about Deuteronomy chapter 33. And it says this, and as your days so your strength shall be. What does that mean? As your days, so your strength will be. That means if God's given you today, he's giving you the strength that you need to be obedient to him. That his presence is enough. That even though you feel weak in and of your own power, strength, and ability, if God's given you breath in your lungs today, he's given you the strength to be obedient even if you feel alone even if you feel overwhelmed, even if the storm, whether it's literal or physical or or metaphorical, whatever that thing is, he's given you the strength to be obedient to him because his presence is enough. I wanna remind you, a promise is only as good as the promise maker. And we serve a God who has never broken a promise. We serve a God that is all powerful, all knowing, all present, He is all good and he is all righteous and we can trust his promises that our God will never leave us or forsake us. I don't know where you are right now. I don't know whether you feel like you've been alone for a long time or if maybe you're just kind of dipping your toes into that season but life has changed and you feel abandoned, you feel let down, Whatever it is, I wanna encourage you to cling to this promise this morning that God will never leave you or forsake you, that God is here, that God is with you, that if you are a child of the most high king, he will never let you walk alone. Now, while I was prepping this lesson, uh, I got pretty far into it and thought, man, I'm doing good. I haven't used an alliteration yet. I grew up like very Baptist in the Baptist church where a lot of the points all started with the same letter and then I got to this part and I was like, well, there it is. And what I wanna end with this morning are three things that God's presence should affect in our life. This is not exhaustive, but I want you to write this down as we go through these. God's presence should affect our peace, our pace, and our priorities. Our peace, our pace, and our priorities. I told you we were gonna come back to that whole peace thing. John 16, in me you may have peace. Jesus has overcome the world. We can know peace like the world does not understand because of who Jesus is. God's presence brings our peace when it seems far from us. Isaiah 26, three says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Where are your thoughts? Is your mind stayed on him? Is it focused on him or is it worried about everything else? Because I promise you the presence of God changes things and it brings peace. I, I think the, my peace can run out pretty quick. I, I discovered that in the last couple of weeks. You guys know what happens when a storm hits, right? Power goes out. And so traffic lights go from traffic lights to four-way stops. 
And if you ever thought you should have a whole lot of faith in humanity, I want you to just come alongside me and watch a four-way stop for 30 seconds because no one knows what they're doing at all. I mean, it's a miracle that not everybody in every four-way stop gets in a wreck every day, okay? And that is the quickest thing to make me lose my peace is just watching that, right? We need the peace that only God can bring and his presence can bring. That's different than what the world knows. God's presence should affect our pace. It should affect the way that we go about our lives. I know that I'm in a room full of people that like to go and do and produce and validate their existence and their life and their worth. I get it. But God's word says in Psalm 46:10, be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So often we're trying to do things on our own that we are missing the presence of God that is right there that should affect the pace that we run at. Walking with God means that you are never in a rush because of God, you are always on time. Now I will throw out there, it's not like a justification to be lazy and just kick your feet up all day either. I know there's two sides of the room in here. But whether you're running, 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 or if you're just hanging out and waiting, if we are running at the pace that God's called us to in his presence, it will change the way we live. And then lastly, God's presence should affect our priorities. The presence of God should reorder our priorities in our life. Matthew 6, verse 33 says this, but seek first the kingdom of God of God and his righteousness and all these things. Everything else will come. Everything else will be added to you, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How do you know that? Being and sitting in the presence of the God that created you, that loves you, and that desires you to spend time with him. God's presence should change absolutely everything, but I think that we settle so often for things that are less. We settle to be in the presence of people or things that are less than a good and perfect God that loves us and we miss God's design and God's desire for our life. We settle for lesser than. And I wanna put this in priority for you this morning as we come to a close. If you have everything and everyone around you but you don't know God, you have nothing. But if everyone and everything that you are clinging to has disappeared and gone away, but you have Jesus, God Almighty, you have everything that you need. The presence of God is enough. And this is what I love about our God. We see God the Father in this Old Testament passage that we read in Deuteronomy 31.8. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Then we see Jesus, the Son of God, come in the New Testament, live a perfect life, walked around in human form on this earth and never messed up, lived a perfect life that we could never dream of doing on our own and then went to a cross to pay for my sin and your sin alike. And because he did that and he beat death, we can have a relationship, an eternal relationship with God our Father and he's given us now the Holy Spirit that is with us, that will never leave us. God is with us and God is present and his presence changes everything. Thanks so much for watching. We pray you've been encouraged and challenged. At Champion Force, we focus on advancing the kingdom of God by making disciples, loving our community, and strengthening the church. We are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God and growing in their relationship with Him. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforce.org slash connect. Of course, we can't wait to welcome you in person at one of our three locations in the near future. For campus-specific times and details, just visit our website at championforce.org. We'll see you very soon.